Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hi, Dr. Mark Sims here. I am the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. The, this episode is brought to you by Arizona Hearing Center. The, uh, at Arizona Hearing Center, I help patients to remain independent by treating their hearing loss and remain connected to their family and loved ones. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. I lost him first to his hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then again from complications from the brain tumor itself. I am an E of ENT. I only take care of ears. I've performed 10, 000, over 10,000 surgeries and treated thousands of patients with hearing loss. I also have written a book called Listen Up Hearing, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. You can learn more about that at listenuphearing.com. And today I'm excited because I have Dr. Nina Krauss. She is a professor at Northwestern University. She investigates the neural encoding of speech and music and she and plasticity, and she is the Hugh S. Knowles Chair. She has done earth-shattering and path-breaking research in sound and hearing for more than 30 years. She began her career measuring the response of a single auditory neuron and has gone on to show that the, that the auditory nervous system and the potential for reorganization following learning. These insights and basic biology have galvanized her to investigate auditory learning in humans. She's also the author, and we're gonna talk about this, of her new book of Sound Mind, how a brain, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. How a brain constructs a meaningful sonic world. This is, a, it's an awesome book. I read it and I highly recommend it. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. Well, thank you for inviting me. So tell me about how, you know, we all end up somehow where we are. What was your pathway into this wonderful, amazing world that I've stumbled into and you've stumbled into? Oh, you know, we are so lucky. We are so lucky to be working on sound. And and I, I really did just stumble into it. You know, I, I grew up in a house where more than one language was spoken. My mom was a musician. Um, I certainly had no idea that I was going to end up doing what I'm doing. But I, um, when, you know, when I first went to college, I, I majored in comparative literature because I like to read and I knew some languages. And then I took biology and I've been a biologist ever since. Um, a book that made a very big impression on me was one that I discovered. It was called Biological Foundations of Language. And when I, I, I saw that title, I thought, oh, this is wonderful. It, it, it's possible to um, blend the biology, uh, the biology and the language. And, and really, uh, my work has always uh, crossed a number of disciplines. And and that's where I, I feel most at home. And maybe it's also because, you know, I, I don't, Italian was my first language, um, I, but I don't feel really Italian and I don't feel really American. Um, but I, I feel that I, I, I exist at the intersection of these countries. Um, and um, good countries and to intersect at. I'll tell that's you. yeah. Oh, indeed. And, <laughs> and, and, and I, but I'm comfortable at the intersection and, and I, I feel that way scientifically as well. That's great. I mean, you know, um, I got the uh, preview copy. Is your book out yet, or is it? It is. It is That's out. Great. It is available, and uh, and and it's doing well. So, and I, I encourage people. My my publisher is, is saying, you know, get it, it's 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 really doing well. They're into a second printing, and um, and and you know, there are all these supply chain issues. Issues, yeah. So. Um, Anyway, I, I hope well, that, uh, that, well, that. I mean, just if people think about the title of Sound Mind, how a brain constructs a meaningful sonic world. I mean, you're covering like such a broad number of topics there, right? And a, a quick question Is your husband a better guitarist than you? Because I think you said that in the. Oh, my goodness. My husband is a musician. And, ah, okay. uh, a, a, you know, musician with a capital M. And he. So that uh, would be yes. Oh, my goodness. He is a wonderful guitarist and bassist, uh, drummer. Uh, he composes music. He builds amplifiers. Um, I, I have a wonderful partner. And, and also, you know, during the pandemic, he has been doing his teaching from home. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's been really nice from time to time to, to hear bits and bits of, uh, of, of, of the sound that he and his students are making. Well, that's a wonderful sonic world yeah. to exist. Yeah. 
Well, tell me about, you know, the work that you do in your lab. So at BrainVolts, we call our lab BrainVolts, and, and please, anybody listening, do visit our, our website. It's a and, great website. Uh, I've been there. It's amazing. You know, we, we really feel strongly that we want to communicate our little discoveries to anybody who would like to know about them. Uh, start by taking the website tour because there is a lot. There's a little tour bus on the top of the homepage, and um, and there's a lot on that website, um, and and it'll help you find what you're looking for. But what you'll see on the homepage is um, panels that talk about or uh, describe the different uh, the different topics that we study at Brain Vaults. So we study music, we study concussion, we study rhythm. We study aging, language, reading disorders, um, bilingualism, uh, listening and noise. Uh, so so we, we, we study many things and, and you might ask yourself, you know, what, what, what are they doing at Brain Vaults? It's all under the umbrella of sound and the brain. And it also, I think, is an indication of how pervasive sound is in our lives. You know, all of these topics have sound at their core, and sound is increasingly underappreciated. One of the reasons I wrote my book is because uh, I, I, you know, I, I it is my it's my love letter to sound, and in, in this increasingly uh, visually dominated world of ours, um, I think we really lose sight of how absolutely crucial sound is for almost everything we do, for almost everything that we think is important. And uh, essentially, sound connects us. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, look, there are some things that are visually beautiful that invoke incredible emotion. But, you know, when I think about some of the things that sound can do and the emotions that it invokes, at least to me personally, they're much more uh, broader and they're much more in depth. And that might be my own bias, but you know, I mean, people don't really think about it, but somebody telling you they love you is uh, an incredible thing to a sound to set of sounds to be able to hear. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think it's amazing. Yeah. And, and, and if you think that I mean, as uh, as humans, you know, we have been communicating with each other for hundreds of thousands of years through sound. Vision, um, in terms of communication, so writing is only five thousand years old. So you know, our our brain is really, uh, in terms of what we remember, how we remember, what we pay attention to, we are really wired for sound. Um, and, and as our primary form of communication, as compared to hunting and gathering and protection, is sound and vision. Ab right? Absolutely, absolutely. And also another um, another aspect of sound is is what, what you and I are doing right now. You know, is sound is in the moment, and sound connects us in a way that you know neither one of us have a script, but we, right. we are everyday improvisers. And I listen to you. And, you know, we respond back and forth. And it is what uh, Ian McGilchrist calls betweenness. And this betweenness um, is, is really one of the richest things that um, exists in, 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 in the world, this, this reciprocal interaction. Uh, and in my opinion, sound um, just embodies this betweenness more than anything else can. Yeah, it's it's fascinating because I mean, if you just think about texting, right? I mean, you know, and how many, you know, you can see those spoops of when people text and they have a misunderstanding because somebody says something in the written language that it, you know there's a spoof as compared to the spoken language, and it's kind of interesting because I was just thinking about what you're talking about, and sometimes I have people who text me voice messages, and they're actually much more rich than the written one, right? Because yeah. The, and but, but, but the other and thing, actually more efficient, amazingly. <laughs> indeed. So, so there are a couple of things about that. First of all, with um, with sound, like right now, for example, um, the, w sound is the, the context is obvious. It's right, right. here. It's immediate. Right. So, in terms of misunderstanding, um, it's it's harder to do. 
happens, because but harder. <laughs> we, we, we understand the context, where, whereas when you're reading something, you have to kind of build up and set up, you know, what, what are we talking about here? Um, so, so, so the context really does matter, and it's something that we can get very straightforwardly through sound. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of like kind of the evolution of just interactive tools, right? You know, because the email is dominated for so long and texting and people, unfortunately, don't call each other on the phone anymore, right? So that, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 also, so, so people are have been surprised. I mean, one of the, of the, of the things that really has grown lately is uh, audiobooks. No, and I know. People I... are surprised. In fact, I, I read your mm-hmm. book by listening to it. Yeah. Um, and so that's I for my children, by the way. It was your children reading it? Yeah, yeah, who read it. Isn't that great? It is. It is. Ah, that's just so wonderful. Um, and 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 great voices all around. Because you know, when you read it, when you listen to an audiobook, you you, you need to have good voices. They did a beautiful sure. job. Um, but people are surprised, they'll say, you know, it's easier to listen to I remember better. Yes. Than if I am reading. Well, which is kind of interesting when people read, they actually sometimes put the voice in their head anyway. So they're using a uh, cognitive construct of sound. But also from a biological standpoint, we know that that uh, sound and memory are really, 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 tight. really tightly linked. And again, I think this is yet another reason why sound is so important, because uh, it our, our sonic memories make us who we are you know you have the 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 sounds of your children's voices i have the sound of my children's voices and and, you know when they call you know we 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 have this we say it's so good to hear the sound of your voice why is that it's and 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 it's because you have years of this back and forth sound to meaning connection that is part of who you are and you will respond in a certain way to the sound of your children's voices in a way that nobody else will. No, no, that, 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 that is so true. And actually, you know, as I think of it from a parenting educational point of view, some of my kids are more auditory than visual learners, right? And so that whole concept too, right? Of how yeah, people learn. I don't know. I, I, I really push against this auditory visual. First of all, I really see that you know, uh, making sense of sound really integrates um, all of our senses. True. That's and, true. and I, I, um, a wonderful book written by Laura Otis. It's called Rethinking Thought. She kind of starts with this premise of, um, you know, people talk about auditory and visual learners. And right. she just blows that out of the water uh, by interviewing um, scientists and mathematicians and artists and writers and, um, you know, it, 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 and, and asking them how they think. Right. And um, you know, it, it is it is this 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 confluence, this this combination. You, you, it's everything. It's, right? it's impossible. I mean, you cannot separate these things. And um, and, and you know, I think we like to dichotomize things because it's easier right. to think about it, but it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I guess as as I process what you're saying is what I should probably say is that's how they prefer to learn. It doesn't mean they're they're solely that type of learner. Right. And so, you yeah. know, some of my kids uh, would rather read a book and some of them would rather hear a book. But I, I understand what you're saying. That That is true. They do. They try to say, well, you're an auditory learner. So everything needs to be auditory. And that it's not. It's multisensory to really integrate. And especially these concepts are not simple. So oftentimes you'll do better to use multiple senses. I'm just uh, now just talking about general education. So well, that's really amazing. And then so. Um, Tell me a little bit about like what led you to write the book. Like what was yeah. the, uh, what spawned? Well, I, I've been uh, teaching a class called uh, Biological Foundations of Speech and Music. Sound familiar? <laughs> yes. Uh, I've been teaching it for, for, you know, for 20 years. And, and I, I started the class from, from, from scratch. And uh, so I've been doing, you know, research on this book now for all these, these years and and my students have been asking me, um, you know, what don't don't you have a book? Don't you have a uh, you know where can I get this information all in one place? Because I've just you know been assigning various readings, and I and also you know, the, the the students in my biological foundations um, often many of them are um, they're undergrads, art majors, um, 
biology, engineering, neuroscience, okay, disciplines. That's uh, awesome. Speech, uh, audiology. Um, so really, really different. And 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 I realized my my favorite audience is um, my my favorite audience is is the the curious. The, 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 what you might call the curious outsider, you know, someone who is not necessarily a specialist. I mean, I love talking to specialists, but I really, really like talking to people who are, um, you know, who, who, who do completely love learning. work. But everybody, it turns out, I mean, and, and again, I've experienced this over the years, um, you know, at, at, at dinner conversations or just as I talk to people, people are interested in sound and the brain. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness! There, there. Everybody has a story about their their father with hearing loss, their child with an auditory processing problem. That you know, and 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 they want to be better musicians. They they're, they're, should I teach my child another language? I mean, there, there are all these questions, and um, and and you know, and head injury is, is is another one where you know, making sense of sound is one of the hardest jobs we ask our brain to do. And so getting a concussion will disrupt that. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's everywhere. And I wanted to put this all in one place in language that, um, that, 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 that anyone can, can understand my, um, uh, you know, my audience is, is, is a, um, you know, like an interested high school student. Right. Um, and 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 old man and, and and anybody in between, um, it's full of stories, personal stories, because science. I you know want to get across science is done by humans, right. and I'm a human with my own little stories. Um, there is art in science. I've been working with an illustrator. There are 80 pictures in the book. Yes, the um, illustrations and, are very nice. You know, and they're even more beautiful in color. Uh, you know the the book is grayscale, um, and um, so so it, it it really was and is my my desire and, and it, it it's funny that, that people have read the book and and said um, I, I never I didn't realize that sound was so important and that it was so much a part of my life. Um, you know, cause I, when I was getting ready to publish the book, I was thinking, why am I even writing this book? Everything I'm saying is so obvious. Obvious to but, you, not to them. But, but, you know, people really come back and, and, and say these things. And, um, so it, it, it makes me, uh, want people to love sound and appreciate it, honor it. Um, because sound is invisible, right? And yeah. so people don't realize that it's such a powerful force. Because and taken for granted, right? Well, there are you know powerful forces like gravity, right? Also, you you can't you know, but it's a very powerful force. Um, and but we as as long as we begin to recognize it, and we start to also. Um, you know, it's also my call to action. What can we do to strengthen our sound minds? What can we do to help create a sonic world that is um, is 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 more sonically friendly? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because uh, you know your story about writing the book is similar to mine. As you know, I wrote a book, and and they do the exact same. You know, what happened to me is somebody said, "Hey, you you need to write all this down." And I was like, what do you mean? They said, you should write a book. And then all of a sudden I'm writing a book. And so uh, it's of a similar nature that, you know, you, you want to record it all. But the other thing is obviously I'm coming from a, you know, we're talking about the same thing. Mine's from a treatment point of view, but it is amazing because what I want to do is get people to get to your stuff, if that makes sense, to be able to appreciate all of the wonderfulness of sound. Um, and uh, yeah. so we're kind of coming at it, you know, the thing I would say about your book, having read it is the curation is excellent. In other words, you're right. These are very, perhaps things that everybody knows, which really isn't true, but you are, how you curate it is wonderful. Um, and seeing it through your lens is very enjoyable. Thank you. You know, I, I, I do want to say that in reading your book, um, I, I think a core 
message of your book is, you know, that, that, that you don't, um, you know, you, you don't dispense hearing aids, you treat hearing loss. Yeah. And uh, in treating hearing loss, you are treating the individual, you are treating the, the whole person and um, the kind of hearing health and hearing health care um, and even the devices that people might end up with are going to change. They're going to differ depending on the person. And, yes. you know, I'm, my book is, a, is really the biological story of how we all hear the world differently, right. regardless of our audiogram. Right. We are different people. And um, so, of course, your hearing health care is going to be um, unique. And, and, and but it's something that one has to be to, to really fight against in in this world where, you know, people are, are um, you know, biologists, audiologists, ENTs are seen as interchangeable commodities as our patients. You know, how many patients did you see? That's not just, you know, it's just not true. It's not good medicine. It's not good science. Um, and so, you know, to, to really make people appreciate how important the individual is and how important also having a longitudinal relationship, both for healthcare and also some of the best science is when you have, you know, a subject as his own control. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, there's just a world of knowledge there that, that people are just throwing out the window, just ignoring. Well, you know, it's, it's, if you want to think about it in terms of like algorithms, right? It's where the algorithm comes from. Does it come inside of the device or does it come inside of, you know, a more uh, holistic algorithm of the interaction of the patient with the world and then the providers and the technology. And sometimes people can't look at it. It's too complex and it's not as uh, cookie cutterish. But it's really the way all healthcare should be, whether or not it is or isn't, right? I mean, even managing your blood pressure is not just a pill, right? It's your relationship with your doctor and them explaining to you and your lifestyle and what you do and what you are willing to do and how worried you are and your family history. It's always so much more complex than why well, have high blood pressure, just get a pill and that's it, right? And so it's it's people's uh, paradigm about health and problems. And I think your book drives that home in terms of how complex it is to just say, well, there's just one program and everybody gets it. I mean, you know, a blow away statistic to me is, is you know, 90% of hearing aids out there are on basically what they would call factory settings off of the, you know, generic uh, algorithm that these manufacturers make. And you can believe that those people can hear a lot better if they actually got somebody to delve in deeper to their hearing experience and their sound experience to get them to be yeah, better. And, and, you know, the, the, our brain is constantly uh, changing. And, uh, you know, for, for various reasons, and that, that's just kind of what it does. Um, and Which having, cool. <laughs> having a, it's, it's wonderful. It's yeah. something to celebrate and something to, to use and to have a partner. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, boy, if I, if, if, if I needed a, a hearing aid right now, um, you know, I, I, I think the kind of, of health care that, that you're talking about, you know, where you really would have someone who would not only do an, 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 an evaluation, but would follow me year after year after year and constantly uh, inform me about updates in the field in terms of technology and constantly monitor me. And so, you know, one of the things that, that is my hope, uh, so Mark, um, you know, in, in, in my book I, and what we do at Brain Vaults is, um, you know, we uh, we, we can measure sound processing in the brain with tremendous precision right. um, using the, the, the FFR, the frequency following response. So, you know, of course, as I'm talking to anybody who is listening, the neurons in their brain are producing sound, which we can measure with scalp electrodes. And we have figured out a way of... Um, you know, it just as as a visual object has these obvious uh, shape, size, texture, and um, and 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 feel to it, color. These are all ingredients, and sound also has yes. ingredients 
Of course, all of this is invisible, invisible. So, you know, there are ingredients like pitch and timing, timbre, phase, loudness, right. all of these ingredients. And you know, the, 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 the uh, metaphor that I use in my book is of a mixing board, you know, where you have these ingredients, you have a mixing bowl full of ingredients that enter your ear and go into your brain. And then you think of your brain as a mixing board where the faders on the mixing board go up and down. Um, and we can get a sense of how good a job your brain is doing processing these different sound ingredients. So that we've learned a lot of things. This has taught us a lot. But my, my, my hope is that this kind of assessment and reassessment will become the standard of care for people uh, who are managing hearing health so that um, this will inform hearing aid uh, decisions. It'll inform which aids it will help in fitting. It will help in monitoring over time um, you know, to have yet another tool in the hearing health care's toolbox yes. to uh, understand what is going on in this individual who they have in front of them. Yeah, I mean, I will tell you, uh, extrapolating that out to the cochlear implantation world, uh, in my clinical experience, you know, I, I, some of the poor performers that I've come across in my uh, practice, people who didn't do well, I believe it was cognitive, right? Like they had had cognitive issues and just weren't able to process the signal that the cochlear implant was putting out. And so you're talking about the types of tools that would be great, right? If we could do that before, not that they shouldn't get an implant, but if we could prognosticate and tell them like, look, you know, you are aren't processing well, or, you know, why do people have degrading performance? Well, your, your testing could, could tell us that, right? That they're not processing the information as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because, you know, again, one of the, the points in my book is that um, the hearing brain is vast. You know, people, I think, classically think of the hearing pathway as this ear to brain. And then there is the brain to ear pathway that, you know, the, brain, the, the ear has to listen to the brain. But importantly, the hearing brain engages how we think, mm-hmm. how we feel, how we move and how we integrate information from other senses. And so, you know, more formally put, we can say that the hearing brain engages our cognitive, sensory, motor, and reward circuitry. And we know this is the case from a biological perspective. And so um, a response like the FFR really gives you a snapshot. It gives you a snapshot of all of uh, of these factors because it really does track with your auditory memory, so your cognition, your auditory attention, um, your uh, ability to, to, to bind information from vision and hearing. All of these things uh, can be revealed in this, this snapshot of auditory processing, this biological um, event, which I, I think really could um, improve the kind of uh, hearing health care delivery that you um, advocate. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's going to be a custom where we're really measuring those things and what you can do and, you know, uh, getting beyond just thinking it's the technology, right? It's not just the, the hardware, which is to me, the beginning. And, and I will tell you, it's kind of funny how I've evolved. You know, when you look at the diagrams that uh, we use, you know, just to counsel patients, it's like the, the ear is like this big. And then on the side, it just says brain. Right. And I, when I was explaining to people, it's like, if you do this to scale, like your brain goes through the ceiling and through the floor and we're not putting that at all, but you'd be amazed at how much that really is where all of this stuff happens. Right. And then, you know, there's other places where that comes into play for uh, for me, you know, clinically, it's like, look, your brain's involved in this process. And to be able to give a little look into that would be amazing to help people to understand and to counsel them and to see what we could get. Like, you're talking about maybe a fine tuning, right, that you could even get this stuff better if you adjusted the instrument. Absolutely. So I think it would help you, first of all, f- figuring out what are the bottlenecks. So so first, you you know, you measure the brain's response to to speech. 
Right. And you look at, you know, where the strengths and weaknesses are in terms of the faders on the mixing board. Right. Um, and then, you know, you think about, okay, well, so I bet this person would benefit from this kind of a hearing aid. So right. you put this kind of a hearing aid on and now you measure the same, put it on that, 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 that same brain and you see what does that hearing aid do? And you might try a different hearing aid and, you know, you can see which hearing aid seems to be more effective or which setting gives right. you the better, better um, audition or perception. Exactly. Right. And, and then over time, you know, as someone takes their hearing aid home and uses it, then they come back again and, and you compare, uh, you know, th this is what the faders looked like. This is this is you know how they were measuring um, the, the the harmonics, the fundamental frequency, the phase, all of these aspects of sound. This is how they were processing them before they experienced it, the hearing aid in their daily life. After using it for two months or three months, um, then they come back, and then again, based on what you see, you can again have a, a feedback on G this part really still is not, um, uh, you know, the, 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 we're not getting the strength of the, of the fundamental frequency or of, of the harmonics or of some, some aspect of sound and, you know, knowledge of the technology. Um, maybe if I, I change the hearing aid this way or that way, and you can actually change the settings, put it back on the person and see, um, what, what, well, what does this do? So it's, be, it's almost like your personal trainer of your uh, hearing, right? If that makes sense, because you're really going to, you know, rather than uh, just kind of go out and do a, you know, a, a video or follow an app, you're, you're really like focusing in on what particular weaknesses. That's really, that'd be amazing. All right. So you're going to roll that out by next week, I assume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Christmas. Christmas. There you go. All right. We'll give you a little couple of more weeks to get that out. That's great. Is that actually, where is that in terms of going from, I mean, is that commercially being used anywhere? Or? Well, I mean, there are some clinics that, that are using it. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, really anybody who has um, some physiologic recording equipment uh, is likely to, to be able to, to, to measure this. Um, and, and, and really the, the, the tough, the toughest part is um is interpreting the findings yeah, and yeah. you know there are some very basic guide guidelines uh, we've written about this extensively we have norms we have stimuli that we make readily available to anybody who wants them we have a toolbox that that we you know we make readily available to anybody who wants to use it for analysis and uh, and when we have as you mentioned at the beginning we have uh, oceans of, of of publications and in fact, my, my colleague, uh, Jen Crisman and I, uh, we just wrote a second tutorial that was published in, um, in hearing, hearing research, um, that is, a, an FFR tutorial on analysis because, uh, you know, people come from all over the world to want to learn what it is that we do. Um, and so we, we really want to make that information as available as possible to, to people. That's wonderful. Somebody in the communication world is communicating effectively. That's actually wonderful. I mean, when you think about it, right. Cause you're even organizing your website in a good communication way. So it's a, it's a holistic approach to getting information out there. That's, that's really excellent. So what's your favorite part of your book? Oh, every part of it. Really, every so the, the the first third of the book, or maybe even quarter of the book, first quarter of the book is how sound works, and uh, you know I feel often like like you know the the little kid who wants to be told the same story over and over again. I mean, I have told the story of how sound works. I've been told the story, and each time, you know, it's like, oh, tell me again. This is such a fun story. Um, and and so I, I love that 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 first part, which is really talking about uh, you know that we have this movement of air and and that then our, our brain needs to make sense of all that information that is in the air that we don't see, but that our brain can really 
make sense of and that our hearing brain is the speediest of all of our senses, that the information, you know, in, in microseconds of timing has to be processed in microsecond timing. Um, and, and, and it's kind of beautiful to be able to see the sound wave reflected in the brain wave. Um, and, and I also you know, talk a little bit about my, um, you know, my, my scientific process uh, in, in, in uh, you know, sort of developing some of the things that we do at, at, at Brain Volts. Um, but then most of the book, um, two thirds of the book is our sonic cells, right. which is really, um, you know, taking topics like noise, Depression. noise, rhythm, aging, aging, yes, um, yes. bilingualism, concussion, yeah. um, bird song. That's right. I, I, that's actually fascinating. The bird song one. I remember that was a great chapter. Right. Um, yes. And 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 really just applying the, the, these ideas of how sound works, but really applying them to the things we care about. You know, how can I um, teach music better? Uh, you know, the, the the fact that there is this that, that language is rooted in sound. I mean, kids with with uh, with 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 uh, reading problems, most of them really have difficulty with sound processing. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're not making the sound to meaning connections first, you're never going to make the connection between the visual yeah. item and the sound. Um, so, you know, kind of giving, giving that, that, that perspective and always, um, you know, with it, the idea of what can we do to, um, to, 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 to make the best decisions for, for ourselves and our children and our society. Um, you know, I, I talk about some of the, the work that we did in, um, in schools where, uh, and, and many of these schools were for low-income kids. Many of the kids uh, had linguistic deprivation, so they weren't um, spoken to that much um, by their, 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 their families. And, you know, we know that it's really important. It's really important to talk to your kid, you know, and, 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 and so people ask you, how do I strengthen my sound mind? And I, I'm thinking, well, um, you know, talk to your kid. Don't talk to your phone. Yeah. Work it out. Um, yeah. And, and, and so that, 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 that um, strengthening of the sound mind is, is something that I think if we realize how, important it is, we realize that there's so many little things that we can do in our daily lives to, um, to, to make sound processing stronger in our brains and in our relationships with others. Um, and, and the other thing that, that is, is fascinating to me is how sound connects us also to other living things. So, you know, there's the bird song chapter, right. um, you know, so, so animals use sound tremendously for, for their survival. Um, but even, even plants and trees, I mean, every plumber will tell you that, um, that the roots of trees are going to find their way into the pipes. Why is that? Because the roots can sense, uh, it's about a hundred Hertz that's the flow of water, and, and the trees can sense that. And they communicate, the plants. Um, <laughs> there are, 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 are flowers that will only release their pollen when they hear a bee buzzing at a particular frequency <laughs> that they know. So, so, I mean, you could imagine, that, you know, I mean, did you ever think about, it just blows me away, did you ever think about a, 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 a plant having tuning to particular frequencies that it's going to release its pollen only when a bee at a certain frequency buzzes around it. Um, so it, it, it's, it, it's, it's just, it, I am in awe. I am just in awe of sound and its importance to us. And I hope that I, um, I, I convey that and, uh, 
my we respect. Do 110%. For it. You know, what we know and what we don't know, you know, I think also really admitting that we don't know, we, heart, we really don't know much. We, we don't know anything. You no, know, we're just we, scratching the surface on this stuff. Oh, my right? goodness. Which is um, wonderful. It's yeah. Wonderful. Um, so so I, I hope it will make good reading at any time. And especially, you know, I, I, I just think about people, uh, you know, maybe this will make good holiday reading. You know, when when people have a little bit of of time to time. to to sit and read and um and then you know be surrounded by the sounds of of family. That's great. So the book is of sound mind: how a brain constructs a meaningful sonic world. Uh, Doctor Cross, where can they get the book? Anywhere, anywhere you you buy books. So you can Amazon, you know, I assume. Of course, Amazon, and in, it's in Kindle and in audiobook format. Um, the, the hard copy is is great. Uh, it has all the pictures. Um, pictures are great. I love the illustrations. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's that's important. Um, and you know, I I like to support my local bookstore, so you know people can go to your local that. bookstore and get it. Right. So so my local bookstore is called Bookends and Beginnings. And, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're just a, a wonderful place. It's been around for decades. And, and especially now that they're open, thankfully for them, right? That's right. That's right. So, you know, the, the book is, is easy to find at the moment uh, until they, they run out between the first and second printing. Um, and, and, and I hope that, uh, that, that people will, will read it. I really hope that they will read it from beginning to end. And, and also let me know. I love to know. Um, you know, I think some authors are, are really uh, driven by um, hits and sales. I mean, to me, it means much more to me if somebody reads the book and tells me what, what they think about it, what resonates with them, what falls short, than, you know, a book that, that just makes a lot of sales. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can make a lot of sales, but if people don't really read it and think about it, um, that's just not as important to me. I mean, to me, it's really important that 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 people get some meaning from it. So I hope that happens. Well, I would tell you, for personally, it was great. I really enjoyed reading it. It was wonderful. And, you know, I mean, I know I'm in the area, so it's in my wheelhouse, but uh, it was a great perspective on it. And so uh, thank you for writing the book. What What's your favorite style? I love to ask yeah. everybody. Yeah, so that that's such a you know I have so many favorite sounds. Right, well, that, that's me that's like that, that's like asking me. Um, What's your favorite dessert, right? When you like a lot. Yeah, of them. Or, or 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 who's my favorite kid? Right, right. Well, you um, told me I read that you you t- you put that in all of them in their lunches that they're your favorite. So that that's was right. Smart. Yeah, from, so they, so from they did figure it out. It sounds like. Yep, that was <laughs> uh, a story I tell in the book. Um. But I, you know, I love the sound. I, I love the sound of, of of my my children's voices. I love the sound of 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 my husband as he plays music. Um, I love when we I love when we when we sing together. Uh, you know, because all you know, my my we all play some music, and uh, and and it, it's just it's really fun to to mm-hmm. to, to sing together. Um, oh, there's just so many sounds that, that I, I cherish. Um, and we all, so I, I tell a story in, in the book where, um, I'm, I'm talking to my son who is, um, he was in, 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 in the UK at the time. And, um, he's listening to me on my cell phone. And, um, at a certain point he interrupts what I'm saying. And he exclaims, Evanston birdies. Now, I live in a town called Evanston, which is, uh, you know, where Northwestern is. And this is where my son grew up. And, And it was just, it was just wonderful how from across the ocean. You hear them. Um, everybody knows the sound of home. Yes. You know the sound of home. And, um that's magical. It's 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 wonderful, and we all have our own sounds of home. And I, I like that you ask people that question because, um, 
you know, our, our brains are all individually tuned to hear sound in, in, in our own way, uh, depending on our experience with it. Yeah, and it also, to me, it drives home why we're all so passionate about what we do, right? Like, this is a wonderful world right? The, 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 the world of sound. So, well, thank you so much. Uh, this has been, I mean, we could go on for a really long time because this is fascinating. If people want to get a hold of you, how would they get a hold of you? Go to Brain Bolt or where would they? Yeah. Be? So, uh, uh, you can really just send me an email. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I, I really, I, I hope that, 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 that people do spend some time on, on the website and, um, and, and reading the book. And, uh, and if anybody wants to get in touch with me, I'm, I'm easy to reach. Great. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been uh, really wonderful. And I hope everybody goes out and gets a copy of your book. Thanks for coming on. Mark, thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.